Out, a podcast production of Manico Studios. I'm Jordan. And I'm Sarah. Well, we've made it to our third episode. <laughs> we did, not without a small amount of struggle. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You're in a new location this time. Of course, our, our audience won't be able to tell because we haven't been filming for the past two episodes. But we're here in person for the first we're time here. and you're in a new location. That's true. Um, if there is a moment of like just stress or deer in headlight luck on this end, it is because I am making sure everything is running and working properly and <laughs> it's going well so far, Sarah. So we're just going to sound some good vibes about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So can you tell the audience where you are at this point in time right now? I certainly can. So I am currently in Philadelphia. As I think we all know, Sarah is across the way in Delaware. Um, I'm actually, though, in... Today's my first day in my new office space, yeah. which I'm very excited about. My first time I ever had like my own office. Um, so it's pretty bare. Uh, you'll That's why it probably is going to sound really echoey. <laughs> um, but you know, you live, you learn. We just got to work. I think the goal is we just improve our production quality a little bit each week. <laughs> each week. Yeah. Yeah. We're moving up slowly in the world. Well, next week, are we going to like find a fully decorated office space? You know, like a nice couch. Is it going to be like a totally different living situation? Oh, I wish, you know, I wish there was a couch. It's not, it's, unfortunately, it's not that big. Um, oh. It's going to be like a, a couple desks and a couple bookcase situation. But it's going to be, I'm trying to get some plants. Probably, let's be honest, they're going to probably be fake just to warm it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't necessarily know if it's going to be crazy. It's going to make me feel like it's a lot more, you know, homely and lived in. But I would... Couch is like season two. That's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's kind of funny because on my end, it looks like you're you're in like a a prison cell in 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 for like questioning. Someone's yeah. like <laughs> watching you from across the table. <laughs> you're not wrong. I mean, the <laughs> lights are very bright. I was doing a couple like video tests, and I could really see the bags under my eyes, which was really attractive oh, so okay. i was like you know oh, what? no 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 it is <laughs> it is what it is <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um, but this is like fun though because uh what's today today th today's thursday so yesterday was wednesday so yesterday we put up the first episode uh sarah thank you so much for all of your hard work and making that happen and getting us there so namaste yeah yeah i'm super excited i was getting really pumped right before uh, we premiered it on YouTube and it's currently up on Spotify as well. Um, it's going to take a couple more days, um, but we'll, we'll be sure to let everyone know that it's on. <laughs> and your lights just suddenly turned up. Oh my goodness. Oh. Okay. That's another thing I learned today. And there might be, okay, this is, I'm so sorry to interrupt your story, Sarah, but I did not see oh, myself no, for fine. success because I just moved into this place today. I'm like, oh yeah, we can, re we can make it like record the episode. That's when I realized today, these are motion censored lights. So if you don't move in some time, like all the lights turn off and I don't know, I need to talk to my guy to see if that's like how we like mitigate that. So <laughs> you might just have to break into a dance every couple of minutes. You know, I might, I might just have to, or if it just suddenly goes black. That's also the reason. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it is what it is. I'm so sorry, Sarah. But yes, it's up on spot it's up on YouTube and Spotify currently and Apple Podcasts in a few days. Yes. Yep. And we'll be sure to let everyone know um when it's up there. It's just you know, programming, things like that. It just it's gonna take a couple more days for it to, you know, figure itself out. <laughs> I was hoping it would be up on on launch date, but it wouldn't be, so you know, yeah, it is, you know this this is very on brands i feel like i just want to like whatever opportunity the world and like technology can like humble us i think that's what it's trying to do oh. it wants us to know who's really boss but it's certainly not me <laughs> <laughs> oh absolutely oh man um yeah so i'm super stoked first one went up uh just some introductions but yeah uh, to, uh the, mm, I'm gonna try this again. the second one will go up obviously next wednesday but sarah what are we talking about today i'm actually like pretty stoked about this yeah so um in contrast with like some of the conversations we've been having for the past couple of weeks 
this is more of a how-to episode. It's how to make a film from practically nothing. And we both have quite a bit of experience in that area. So I'm very excited. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think I'm really stoked too, to hear, like, I think we always, like, well, I always harp on our age difference. I think it's very, it's like cool, but I think it's one of the, like, one of the areas where it's going to be really interesting and helpful just because, like, you're in college, I'm out of college for by a few years. So it's just kind of, it's just kind of, I think, a couple different experiences. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a cool perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've, we both, like, like you've mentioned, we've both had, quite a bit of experience in this subject in different areas. Um, I, to start out, like I, I'm of course in college and many a student film, a senior thesis and things like that are mm-hmm. on a very, very limited budget. And the budget is, you know, people who donate to the project. Um, so I've learned a lot working on quite a bit of sets and I'm sure you have as well. And I'd love to get into kind of just like what we've learned and and for someone who's also interested in starting a film and they don't really have much as far as like tools, equipment, money, things like that, how we, you know, how we start, how, how we, how we, how we get started into <laughs> a film project and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you sort of start at the beginning in like the pre-reduction world? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. We can just like dive and, you know, talk about all different aspects of production and, I think the first, you know, important one is your pre-production phase. It's kind of like the existential phase and also existential crisis phase that happens because you're like, oh, I want to make a movie, but I have absolutely nothing. So this is where all the panic sets and is in this uh, pre-production phase. So I'm sure to start off, I'm sure if you're thinking about of making a film, you've obviously come up with some sort of story and... If you want to do it professionally, you know, we've got some, you know, great screenwriting, you know, applications that you could use. There's Final Draft, Celtics, things like that. But that costs money and that sucks that it costs money. Um, so, you know, you're, you're also available to things like Microsoft Word. Is it a screenwriting software? No, but it'll do just fine. And there's also Writer Duet. Writer Duet is a great screenwriting software. Uh that you can use online and it's free. So Writer Duet and Word for Me are very, you know, feasible, budget-friendly options if you're looking to make a script um, and you kind of want to create that script format. Um, but, you know, the, the ones that like are, are final draft, the ones that do cost quite a bit of money, um, you know, if you're a student or you work in an office job, take a look at, you know, discounts or, um, you know, offers that might be running in, in your area or on a website if you're you know, a student, um, you know, being, being a student is very valuable sometimes. I know books and, you know, it's expenses and tuition is, are very expensive, but they fortunately, you know, cut you some discounts in some different areas and usually uh, screenwriting software is one of them. So uh, be, be sure on the lookout if you are a student, you know, also I mentioned before, if you're working in an office, things like that, uh, they usually have offers, special offers and discounts for softwares yeah and I think that what's what's hard is that when I remember when I was in college you know yeah I got the college discount but I felt like there was a lot more uh free options like that when I was in college like I don't know if you call it Celtics or Celtics I kind of always put it both that was free at the time and now I think that it's um, on a I mean I think there's like a it's like a free, <clears throat> me, a freemium model but um it's not like yeah. you can't have the full access for free and even like uh, back in the day, like in the creative cl- Adobe Creative Cloud, they had Adobe Story, which was a, like included it as a screenwriting software. So I think it's a little bit, it's interesting. <clears throat> and there's the air conditioning. Um, it's <laughs> interesting how <laughs> um, how it that gets changed. And it's act, you know, it's not as easy to find free, you know, outside the student or any other like type of educational discount. Um, but so actually, I would love to have your like opinion on this as well because I'm not I'm not like one who's uh, that like oh this is my favorite script writing software like everything else is shit like I I'm I think some people are kind of like Final Draft like like you know like this that's that's their baby and or things like that and I I use Final Draft just because I once again I got I got a nice uh, discount on it but I'm not too like 
I don't find one program to be superior to another, at least not for like what I've been doing. Exactly. I totally agree. And I think that's, you know, that's another reason why it's extremely important to look for free, um, great quality options, uh, like writer duet, for instance, um, it's free. It's like, you know, on the cloud kind of sort of site. Um, but it does its job similar to, you know, the hundred dollars you'd pay for final draft, you know, <laughs> there's a big difference in price, but you know, the, the, there's this very much similarities in how they operate and things like that. Um, and I used, I used writer draft, uh, writer duet, sorry. When I first started out, um, as you know, like the free option. And I was like, oh, this is, this is great. Like, I don't see why I need to pay for anything else, you know? Um, but I moved up to final draft because it was offered as a student discount for me, but I probably wouldn't have used it if I didn't have that discount. I probably would have stuck with writer duet because it works just as fine. Absolutely. Now the dream of all dreams is studio binder. Like what the day, oh. one day that, that is like my, like, just because it has so many cool, I, I, I don't know, I'm kind of thrilled. That's like not, that is, that is actually against the topic, which is called, you know, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's like more of a, a cost to your service. Um, oh, but yeah. yeah, but there's definitely, like, have, I, yeah, even though Word, of course, Word isn't ideal, but like to your it's point, it's, it's there and exactly, like it's a job done. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it, any, any, any Word document, honestly, just does the trick if it keeps you from like writing by hand it 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 works <laughs> it might not look the same but it still does its job absolutely so the next talking point in pre-production would be your crew and cast members um looking for people to join your team and we have quite the bit of experience in that as we've been you know um looking and scouting for crew and cast members for our Nanico productions. And of course I would like student films and things like that. Um, there's a lot of different options in how you look for crew and cast members, but I'm curious to hear about your opinions. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's one of those, it's one of those catch 22s. There's a, obviously a lot of very talented people out there and talented people and people who, you know, have, devote to their craft deserve, not just resignation, but they do deserve compensation. Just like, you know, like, I don't want to go out there, you know, with my camera and work for free. No, no, one, I guess the point is like, no one really wants to work for free. So it's, yeah. and so, and particularly when you're talking, like when you're talking about a technical role, whether that's um, behind the camera or even in front of the camera, there, there's something to be said sometimes. So, and I want to put a big asterisk sometimes uh, where you can, where you can get what you pay for it. And I, I'm really referencing, it's like, I remember when I was a kid, and, you know, you want to make fun little, you just want to make short films. You don't care what they look like. You just want to put a camera in your hand. So you, what do you do? You go to your friends or you go to your family and you're like, hey, you show them in front of the camera. And they might have, they might not have any interest whatsoever in, in, you know, acting, but they'll do it for you kind of a thing. So obviously that's going right. to be that caliber. But I think what's been so, it's been so, um, I don't know what the word is. I have here, but it's been so cool about, particularly the project we worked on this spring is we had such talented talent that, and they were pretty fresh or, or you know new on the scene and i think it was it was cool to to say to see that you know talented people are are, are everywhere with all you know sorts of experience they could have you or i think we had a really cool um perspective in that we had people that might have had decades of professional acting experience all the way down to this was their first or their second gig, so to speak. So I think, and and they were all, you know, it was all even across the board. So I think, I don't know, it's, it's, this one's a hard one for me because I think that, you know, there's always unicorns. There's, there's all, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if, I, I think I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't know if I'm evading the question or not, but it's like, I think that's, it's the cast, it's just one of the, I think it's so case by case, you know? And I think it's really just, Finding a good fit. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if this, is, this one's helpful. This one's hard for me. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, take a look at your surroundings is what I would recommend. Um, are there people interested in joining, you know, a crew or, or like a, a casting call? Um, are there people interested in learning a new skill and, you know, whether it be sound or uh, camera or things like that? And um, 
you know, you can do that by, you know, putting advertisements out, local news, things like that. Or there's websites that'll help you do that. Um, uh, Backstage is the one we use to find a lot of our cast. Um, There is a $24.95 fee for every call you want to put up, but (laughs) it finds people quick. Um, And of course, you've got like um, all your friends and like you said, family members. Um, The the only um, warning I would kind of use uh, with that would be obviously they might not be as skilled as you'd hope for, things like that. Um, uh, again, what you say, you kind of get what you pay for. Um, or, and <laughs> the light went off again. <laughs> um, but in cases like uh, you're a, a student filmmaker and you go to college with their film and television students, things like that, um, there are th- <laughs> plenty, plenty of opportunities to find cast and crew members. Um, you they're looking to gain experience so you don't really have to necessarily worry about the cost of um you know paying for people on your team um really find people who are 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 more than willing to uh jump on a project and learn that experience and and put it towards their resume because they're going to be some of the hardest workers um people that the go-getters sort of things um it's okay to also cut corners with crew, and that sounds really weird, but if you're kind of like working on the means of like you do have to pay for crew members, you do have to pay for a cinematographer or a sound guy, you can, you know, cut corners. Like, do you need two PAs or production assistants, or do you really only need one, you know? Do you need a script supervisor, or could your assistant director do that for you? Um so just kind of like think about, you know, what are some, you know, you know, crew members or players that you don't really need um, so you can save your, your funds for the people that will make uh, a big difference on your film set. Sarah, you, you put the you put it in a in such a better package. Than I think I was so I want to commend you on that, because I think that's you make a really good point where it should be equitable. Um, and I think that's that's. You know, in my experience, that's been you know where it's where it's working out for both parties. You know, where if you if you are don't have much of a budget, um, but you know, once again, like you, it might be someone's first or their second opportunity, or if someone just wants to get involved in the project. You know, I think that's I think you that's a really great point. Um, in very in a very succinct manner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, and it's really hard because um, this is honestly a broad topic this topic of how do you make a film from nothing? Like everyone's coming from nothing if you're making a film, but like in in some different area, like if you're a student, your situation will be different um, than someone who's not a student and is just trying to, you know, do this as like a passion project. Um, So so we're trying to, we're we're trying to like bring points to every side of the table and everyone's situation. Um, Like, uh, you know, I am a college student and I do have that experience of where everyone around me in this area also wants to be on film projects. So I have that, you know, fortunate ability to find crew uh, members pretty fast. Whereas, you know, on the flip side of this, uh, we also live in Delaware and (laughs) there's not a lot of filmmakers in Delaware. So we do have to do quite a bit more of a search uh, to get those people on our team. Also, also. So that brings us to our next point of pre-production. It's a really big key point uh, that we all all love desperately. Uh, It's the funding portion. Because if you have zero money, you need to get some. (laughs) Yeah, and the cool thing uh, about today is that there's so many different ways to, you know, get money. I mean, once again, it's like, Back in the day, it was like, hi, mom, hi, dad, hi, grandma. Like, I'm trying to make this short film, whether, you know, whether it's for a school project or whether it's, you know, just for something fun. Can you give me some money? Which is still obviously, I think, a lot of people, you know, bless family, friends who want to support them. But the other cool thing is, it's not new news, but the the fact that there's so many, uh, let me me hit the mic one more time. Uh, There's so (laughs) many uh, crowdfunding platforms out there, whether, you know, so either A, if you have someone of an established audience or B, if you just just, you know, once again, new on the block, things like Kickstarter or um, Indiegogo are, are great, um, are tools. Um, to be honest, I have only really have experience in Kickstarter. Um, so I feel, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I feel a little green 
on the on like the crowdfunding topic just because um I haven't used a lot of them. <laughs> but so I think Sarah, I think this is another area where I feel like you have a correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you have a lot of experience in these different platforms um and have a cool perspective. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Um I've got actually quite a bit of data that is not from me. Uh it's via grasshopper.com, which is a very interesting site name. it's very cute, I love it. Um but yes, I, I do have experience and I've kind of like combined my experience with this data that I found uh, to hopefully give the audience a bit of an understanding of each of the different, uh, you know, uh, sites. So Indiegogo is actually my, uh, one of my favorites. It's the one I use the most. That's not necessarily saying it's the best option, uh, but compared to Kickstarter and GoFundMe, Indiegogo is actually for indie projects and indie film, hence the name. Um, it's also, I, I find, be the most easiest and through like my data, not not saying again, it's it's like obviously the best or choice that you have to go with, but through the data, it's more built for um, filmmakers with flexible funds. So through this data that I found, um, Indiegogo is uh, offers, you know, not only just films, but a, a wide variety of products and things that you want to be made, um, ideas uh, with lower funding goals. Um, so somewhere from like 10,000 and under, um, uh, cause like sites like GoFundMe offer are, are, are usually for, uh, big reach funds and goals and things like that. Uh, Indiegogo has two, uh, different campaigns that you can choose. They have a fixed campaign and a flexible campaign. Uh, by choosing the fixed campaign, it's an all or nothing. So if you don't make your goal of, let's say $5,000, you don't get to keep it. Uh, the flexible campaign is um, by the end of the campaign. If you don't make your 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 five or your set amount, such as like five thousand, and you make like thirty two hundred, you still can keep it. Um, Indiegogo has a five percent platform fee, um, and then three to five percent for PayPal and card transactions, which is uh, pretty reasonable. They've actually, uh, they've I think they went down in price because I think with the flexible. fee, be, it used to be a 9%. So that's how they like used to get you. If you like choose the flexible route, they would take more from it. Uh, so, uh, but they've since changed that. So I'm sure it'll change again in the future. But uh, with Kickstarter, um, Kickstarter is really meant for any, you know, generalized creative project. Um, Kickstarter is also an all or nothing campaign. So if you don't make your, uh, your set amounts, they will not give it to you. Um, the, there's a 5% fee if the campaign is sex, uh, successful, and then there's a 3 to 5% processing pledge fee. Uh, GoFundMe um, is rarely used for film, but it can be. Um, it's more for personal causes and life events. Um, you keep what you earn, and you can also exceed that goal. So let's say your goal amount was 50000 and you make seventy five. You can, of course, keep that and keep the goal, uh, campaign running. Um uh, there's a 5% fee from each donation and a 3% processing uh, fee from the donation for USA and Canada. Now, I, I say all those per percentages and numbers because it is very important to kind of understand what's being taken from your funds. Um, like, if you have a very small goal amount, like I've used before, 5000 or $7,500, uh, 5% is quite a bit of <laughs> your, your funds. Um, so it's, it's important to know kind of like what, what the, um, uh, crowdfunding campaign, uh, the crowdfunding company is taking from your funds. Um, now of course there's a very uh, different option that you can take is Patreon, but Patreon is, uh, monthly subscriptions, um, with a given promise to receive a product every month. Um, so that's more so used for starting up YouTube channels or other things like that, um, where they would, you would receive something monthly in return for your monthly payment to said person. So <laughs> there's all of that information. <laughs> no, fair enough. <laughs> well, sorry, I think that's a really great, like comprehensive look through the major platforms and a very like quick, easily digestible way. Cause I think it can be kind of overwhelming you know, there are, there are different options out there and kind of to figure out, you know, what works or what's best for you and your type of project. Yeah, absolutely. And it, yeah, I, my hope is that for people to understand 
uh, like I said before, like the differences because there are, you know, some heavily differences and they're changing all the time. So Indiegogo, like I mentioned, uh, their their fee has changed, but that's not to say it won't change again in the next couple of months to a year. Um, so it's very important to understand sure. like, how much money they're taking from your campaign or um, if you are <laughs> if you don't reach, reach your goal, it's important to understand that you're not getting the money uh, no matter what you earn. So <laughs> it's important to kind of understand those differences. Um, but again, with all the student films that I'm on and things like that, the go-to option is uh, Indiegogo for them. Um, sometimes you use Kickstarter, um, but it's it's not terribly often. So it's interesting that you have the Kickstarter experience, though. I think that's the interesting yeah. balance that we like have. I mean, yeah, not a lot though. Like I'm not like it's not it's that's something that I. Um, yeah, it's something that I've, I've used a lot of like crowdfunding in the past just because I haven't worked in a lot of, like we talked, I think probably in the first episode, I haven't really worked in a lot of film projects in the last several years that, that, that have been like mine in a way, you know what I'm saying? Where I've been involved yeah. at like that level. Um, so, but it's all, but it's cool that there, I think that's so, what's so great about like the accessibility of the internet is that and it's another, you know, another barrier that we can hopefully knock down by having these types of platforms that are designed to fund small projects you know it's warner yeah. brothers isn't going to freaking you know obvious for uh, that's a stupid example because for obvious reasons um but i think that's what it's it's once again like making it as accessible um to everyone at any budget or no budgets and i and i'm kind of of the mentality that it's better to you know make the film with the money you've got versus like wait until you get the money you want like to me it's more important right. just to like get it out there and get done and move on. Um, but so it's nice that, you know, once again, you know, I even like you read books and like I, I got a couple books for Christmas a few years back from, you know, how to make it or how not to make a short film and things like that. And they're talking about budgets in the tens of thousands of dollars for a short film. And I'm like, that's, you don't have yeah, to wait no. until you get $40,000 to make a movie. <laughs> exactly. Um, Most student films that I'm on, their, their goal on say Indiegogo is, you know, seventy five hundred dollars max, it, but it usually ranges from like thirty five hundred to five k, and, and so that's more. It's more definitely more feasible. Sarah, I'm gonna flip the tables on you and kind of put you on the spot. Um, okay. do you have like a story in in your funding film project land? Do you have a story? I like I like a little a little drama, a little funding drama. Mm. It's, I mean, it's not really drama, but kind of like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's more so <laughs> about like the lack of promotion, the, which is another also heavily mm. huge aspect of, uh, you know, funding is like promoting it. Um, I think the goal was like $2,500 to like make this film and, uh, we did not get anywhere close to that. <laughs> and I was trying to like, you know, get in contact with said director. And I was like, hey, we should like promote it, you know, spread the word out. You know, I'm, I'm doing everything I can on this Instagram page to like promote it. But I need your help to like tell your family and friends to donate, things like that. And we only made like a couple hundred dollars. <laughs> and that sucks because as a producer, you feel like a failure. You feel like you didn't do your job and you're like, I like I w I want to help you. I I really want this project to get somewhere, but I, I I mean I I can't help if you don't help yourself. Kind of situation. Like I was doing everything I could, and uh, said person didn't really do much. <laughs> and sure. I don't I don't know no, sure. no shade on anyone, but like sure. yeah. So said being like yeah, there was it was like a twenty five hundred dollar goal, and only made a couple hundred dollars. And then with the 5% deduction fee, that made it even even less. And everything that they had planned and wanted to do never happened. And things were very much changed. So, yeah, it, it's it's a promotion and, and promoting your work and, and the fund uh, or like the, the campaign is, is extremely important. And I cannot stress that enough. Yeah, I can imagine that's very, very frustrating. Um, particularly, like you, like you said, you're you're a hard worker and you're someone who takes your job seriously. And I'm sure it, it's difficult if you know it's not like 
not everyone feels as motivated maybe is the word um as you yeah yeah and a, and a lot of times you'll see um on top of like this promotion thing a, a lot of times you'll see instagram pages um for films that have you know are, are trying to be released and a lot of uh, you know kids my age students my age they they make you know an instagram page for their film and it's like honestly the most genius idea like i can honestly say it works like even even times like when i've donated to films before um i forget that like the uh campaigns going on and a simple like instagram post reminding uh, reminding you that there's like five days left of the campaign and go donate. Like that's like that, the, you know, it reminds you and then you go donate. Like, so it's, I can't stress enough, like, you know, creating an Instagram page, creating a website. It's honestly the most strategic thing to do if you're, you know, just simply try to fund your, your film and, and get the word out and get people to, to donate and also watch the film, things like that. Um, so so you you like, I, I'm like, I'm following like, you know, 35 different, film pages for for short films but honestly <laughs> it's amazing so well and, and like in the, in, in the vein of trying to you know make a low budget film another great thing about today is that you know having uh, making a website or having instagram with like nice pictures or cool graphics or whatever it's not like a costly thing like it was even five years ago yeah. I mean, you can go on squarespace you can create a, a free squarespace account you don't have any web design experience whatsoever just to put enough information up there for people to you know know what they need to know and the thing is squarespace gives you a certain like free trial period and so if yeah. you play it you play it right you don't even have to pay a dime for it and no one don't like let's keep that to ourselves um but then i know that um and i even do like design work you know professionally and i still can't talk i was talking to somebody today about canvas and how you know, some people like like to turn their nose about Canva because oh, it's you know, it's not do that. Canva's great. It's a it's free. It's free um, uh, tier provides so much or so many features, and it's a great way for anybody, designer or non designer, to create visually appealing graphics. So yeah, so there's once again, there's just a lot of uh, free resources out there um, that are once again accessible because you don't necessarily need to have all this other experience to be able to have something that looks good that looks good i guess is the point i i live by canva <laughs> honestly i know yeah there's like that paying tier where if you like pay you get more access to more designs photos things like that but i only have the free version and it works just fine for me because i do a lot of instagram posting for films like that's another thing i do i i've uh because during um COVID, i was home couldn't be a part of a lot of you know student film projects because everything was happening in Georgia and of course I was home during COVID um so the only way I could really contribute was to doing marketing and <laughs> I've I've learned so much through Canva and just kind of like doing like the design aspects and it's very easy uh and of course most important word it's very free to use uh so uh, yeah, I don't. I don't understand why people should. I love Canva free because it's it's great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think the, there's a, a lot of bad juju around the phrase cutting corners, but I think it's all about just you know learning or understanding like what's the right corners to cut because there's a lot of free or very cheap resources out there. Um, and it'd be yeah. too long to do like an ex, like an exhaustive list, but like things like that just just to get the word out there. And um, and the other the cool thing too is that I think. The, Particularly if you're of that college age or even like that, you know, high school age or post college, or young twenties, people just want to have a lot of experience and they want to learn a lot of new things. And I think you can get a lot of people to help you because, as much as I know we cringe at this word in the creative professional industry, I do as well. It's the exposure word, but there is some there is something to be said about having, um, you know, some portfolio experience, some portfolio experience. Um, <laughs> instead of you know having to feel like you have to hire like oh i have to hire a web designer i have to hire a graphic designer i have to hire the da, 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 and that and that's not necessarily the case oh yeah yeah 100 percent. a lot of us uh you know do multiple roles at once and uh i mean are, are, am i studying to be a graphic designer no <laughs> but i do do marketing um, you know, for Instagram, for films. And I've still learned a lot through the experience of doing it. Um, 
yeah, you don't need a professional to do a lot of this stuff. Um, I mean, like, I mean, will it be quality, work, more quality of, of work if you did hire someone? Yes. But remember, you're trying to save money, you know? Um, so it's it's kind of like this balancing of like saving money versus um, using your funds and expenses expenses for the right reasons and to find the areas of where you do really need to put money out for something. Oh, I think something, Sarah, that you, that you hit on as well that I think I cannot emphasize enough, particularly because, okay, let's be honest, if you're talking about making a film with a tight budget, you're probably, it's one of your, maybe your first project or one of your first few projects. You're, you know, you don't have a lot under your belt, I would presume, if you're making, you know, like a, a, a super tight budget film. And there's nothing wrong with, I think that we all struggle with this idea of everything we do, whether it's not just the final film project, but all of the other moving parts that go into it, everything has to be perfect from the get. And I don't think that, I think that's a, like, that's a mentality that could hold us back because, you know, if, if we wait until we have the money to hire a professional designer, then maybe the film won't happen for another three years. And that's, you know, and think yeah. of all the of learning and growth you can do in those three years. And so I think that's like, uh, so as much as I think this episode is great when it comes to like a lot of tactical advice on how to like, actually, how do you make a film with not a lot of money? I think it's a, another great reminder too. It's like, just do it. Like, it's like, don't, don't yeah. let the money, the money question hold you back from just doing it. Yeah. I love that. So jumping into our next big phase of things is, is a uh, production. Uh, so the start of your film um so another big aspect well it it, it technically does fall under pre-production because you should be looking for it during this phase but um it's location um location you i mean um you are working on location during production so we just put that under that category um (laughs) (laughs) uh, but location uh location is very important um you know it's the aesthetics of your film it's what you want your film to look like um you know, again, we're talking about, you know, not on a budget, what is feasible, what can you do? So if you're a student, um, you know, looking for studios that are available on college campuses is a great option. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of different rooms, especially if you're a film student that you can, you know, go and film in. Um, but if you're looking for more so actual settings for your film, um, looking at Public yet private areas is very important, and I and I it sounds like an oxymoron, but um, you want it to be private enough of an area to where you don't need to get a permit because, of course, permits cost money. Uh, for instance, if you're if you're you know filming on a sidewalk, uh, you know, in, in a city, you're going to need a permit for that. Um, whereas you might find a small park, you know, you can probably do that without you know needing a permit. So uh, it all depends. Uh, always check your city guidelines. Uh, that's something I learned in college because <laughs> we had a whole unit on the that. The hard way? Is, yeah, oh, no. not really the hard way, but it was just like, here's here's like the list of, of things you need to know about permits and c- uh, city ordinances. And if you don't do them, you get fined. So like that's, so we love that. Uh, so if you're um, using a friend's house, you know, living space, things like that, it's obviously a very free option, but it doesn't mean it is the best looking one. Um, you know, you obviously, for your story, you obviously have a specific look in mind and it's often very hard to achieve exactly what you want. So that's why it's important to um, set aside um, some in your budget just for uh, set design and production design and things like that. Um, we, we talked about, you know, kind of like looking for what you want to be in your budget versus like what you don't need to, you know, put out money for production design. I recommend is extremely important to set money aside for because, um, you know, production design also falls under props and costumes and things like that. Things that you utilize in a film. Um, so not only creating the look that you want, but all of those little things to make your film even more special, I believe are very important to the budget. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's another thing too. And this is something that somebody, um, this is something that's it's hard to swallow, I think, because no one wants to, no, no artist, no creative wants to hear this. No one wants to put it in a box. 
But someone told me once, it was like, write the script that you can afford to produce, not the one that like, you know, not the paranormal or, you know, apocalyptic zombie thriller, blah, blah, blah. Of course, we hate that advice because it's like, no, I'm an artist. I want to put out what I want to put out. There is some merit into this. Now, like, spoiler alert, like when we're looking at um, in a couple of months when The Secret of the Old Clock comes out and you see all characters wearing gray sweatshirts and sweatpants, that is not a coincidence. It's because Hanes brand is cheap. And it was a, a way to cut, you know, a, a way to cut corners um, on, on costuming. So I think that's, that's um, you make a good point that it's like you can... I think it all comes back to this kind of the corner thing. Like you can, you know, find cheap locations or cheap costumes or whatever, but you can make up for it in different ways to still like, you know, yeah. create that kind of atmosphere you're looking for. Yeah. You know, like if you're doing a thriller or whatever, you know, fake blood at Party City is like five to 10 bucks, <laughs> which is very feasible. Now, what you don't want to do is you don't want to, you know, create zombies that need full costume to, to create this look because that's going to obviously cost you. So it's very important to kind of like set aside a specific amount in your budget for these types of things and uh, do your best to kind of like work around that via script and as you're, you know, producing the film. Absolutely. So the next step in production is I'm sure a lot of experience or a lot of uh, experience Jordan has in this is the importance of equipment, uh, cinematography, uh, sound design, things like that. How to incorporate equipment that's going to look nice for your film, but also saves you a ton of money and is possibly free for your budget. Sarah, no, I love this topic so much because, you know, it wasn't that long ago I was a very, you know, financially struggling college student and I wanted to make films. I didn't want to rent out the school's equipment. I wanted my own equipment, but of course I had very little money, which I'm sure is everyone in college. And so there's definitely a lot of ways... um, to you know to court granted okay i i don't we, we need to manage expectation here you're not going to have like your christopher nolan like masterpiece solby or dolby surround sound imax theater quality on a 500 hundred dollar budget like that's not going to happen but you can but you can really do a lot particularly now in the technology that exists um to get to be decent so of course when you're talking about equipment you're primarily talking about two things you have your video and your audio now, I think this is not surprising to anyone where as much as like, you know, the photographers and cinematographers of this world, it's like we drool over the video, the visual aspect, but really where you don't want to scrimp is on the audio because that's, that's really what, you know, makes something sound amateur versus a little bit more professional. However, with that said, there are ways to get a pretty decent quality like sound kit for not a lot of money. These numbers might be a little bit off because um, it's been a minute since I bought these things. But when I was in college, for example, at the time, the Rode Video Mic Pro was like the go-to mm. shotgun mic. It plugged right into your DSLR, that 3.5 millimeter jack. And I, it was $229 pre-packed and I needed it. So so the, the, the cool thing is too, I've even bought um, shotgun mics off of Amazon for like, 30, 40 bucks. And guess what? They're not half bad. Granted, you can't stand in a wind tunnel and expect, you know, this like beautiful audio. But um, you have, if you have like a, when I say decent, just just a shotgun mic with some type of dead cat or windscreen on it and put it on a, you know, on a boom pole, you're set. Now, this is my favorite, my favorite anecdote because when I first met Sarah and I still use this, I still have this little rig, if you can even call it a rig. That I used to be kind of embarrassed about because it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty out there. But we've leaned into it because guess what? Once again, you, when you cut corners, you can cut corners and things work. So boom poles, for whatever reason, um, you don't, for most short films, you don't need to have a fancy boom pole. It just needs to be a pole where a mic can screw on one end and you can hold the other. Um, and so, but you would, you know, you'd go online and you'd look at these name brand ones and they could be upwards of a hundred, two hundred dollars. And you're like, no one wants to spend that much on a piece of plastic. So I found back in the day, uh, there was a guy on eBay 
who was making uh, essentially shotgun mic mounts onto painter poles. It was like a plastic adapter. It costs like $13. And then you could go to like your Lowe's, your home people, any of your like local home improvement stores and buy yourself a telescoping painter's pole for 15 bucks. And look, you got a boom pole. And so I'm sure that guy no longer exists. And this is probably eight or 10 years ago, but there are definitely like other op options out there like that, where you could just do a little bit of digging and save yourself a, a substantial amount of money. So when it comes to, oh, Jordan, what's your sound kit? My sound kit is a shotgun mic with a six foot XLR cable that I bought off Amazon. This uh, Jimmy rigged little uh, adapter situation, a, a painter's pole that I got at Lowe's, and then a six foot, uh, three and a half millimeter extent, uh, like audio extension cord I got off of Amazon that plugs into my uh, audio recorder. So the thing is, when I first when I first built this kit, the quote, I always say kit with like these big like what are, quotation marks around it. When I first built this kit in college, it probably only cost, the whole thing: audio recorder, audio cables, XLR cable, shotgun mic, boom pole was probably, uh, with the nice shotgun mic, was probably in the $300 range, as opposed to more like a $500, $600 range if you want name brand. Um, that was a lot of information qu quite quickly. Um, <laughs> but so, but I, I guess the, the thing is, is that once, I, I feel like I'm like being a dead horse here, but the thing is, there's just, there's so many great options out there. You don't just have to buy what everyone else has or what everyone is saying, oh, this is the best. Like right now, like these Sony mirrorless cameras, people are, are, are raving about them. And for good reason, they're beautiful cameras. But if you have a Canon Rebel like T2i it's sitting in the back of your you know mom's closet, if it shoots 1080p in 24 frames per second, you've got yourself a movie camera. Yeah. So I think, uh, I, I think that's just like, and it's hard. I'm not, I think it's easy for me because I'm not a gearhead, never have been. I don't, I don't, I just, uh, I get what I need and it doesn't really, I, whatever is, whatever fits my needs. And so I think it's, I, I have some friends who are, who, who are more in the cinematography world. So of course they're, 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 they're buying the glass They're you know, they're, and they're talking about these specs and things like that. And I'm like, ah, does it turn on? Does it turn off? Does it have these inputs? Like, how can we, how can we stretch it? So, I, so yeah. I guess, I guess my thing is that it, it took, I wonder too, Sarah, um, I'm sure we all had that, at least this is my experience, even in college where you have people, it's like, oh, it becomes like a status symbol. Oh, you, what do you shoot on? Or what's your glass or what's in your, what's in your kit? And it becomes kind of like this weird pecking order that I don't, that I think is kind of silly because at the end of the day, you just want to make a damn film. <laughs> yeah. But in like, in sort of like a weird way, you are kind of a gearhead because you've, you've found ways to like utilize different things and, and make things work for you, you know? Like, I mean, I think the painter's pole is red that you use, but it, like, if it was black, nobody would ever know. Like everyone would think it would just be a boom pole and it is, which is the cool thing that you were, you know, thinking, you know, thinking smart and being able to like utilize things that you would never think to, to work. So I do give you props to that because I mean, like we use that, <laughs> we use that painter's pole all throughout our shoots and it worked perfectly. So I have to admire. No, but I, I appreciate that, Sarah, because, because it is like something that, I mean, 28 years old and still feel a little self-conscious about it just because people make you feel that you have to have, you don't have yeah. this and that means you're nothing or you're trash or you're, so, and I'm not saying that once again, this is not. You know, and sure, maybe it takes a little bit more doctoring and post to, to get it to where you want. But I guess what I, I want to keep on like reiterating, coming back to it's all about like, how do we just get this damn movie made? Like, I'm not going to wait until I can buy this. Like, what can I use instead just to get us there? Um, yeah. That's something. And so, well, I don't know. I'm so that's nice of you to say about the whole gears. But I think something too that I'm past me did that I'm really happy that I did this. When I was in college, I couldn't afford much, but what I could afford, I bought a little bit at a time. So by the time I graduated from college or a couple of years out, I had myself like a nice beginners, like just all around kit with audio stuff, yeah. video stuff, nothing that was top of the line, but enough to just be able to like book gigs or work on projects or things like that. And instead of like, you know, spending $5,000 in one go. Um, so that's something that 
I like present me is glad that past me did kind of. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of I, I'm kind of like in the process of doing that same thing. Like I recently just updated my camera to much better one, um, but beforehand I was using a DSLR that was actually built for photos and photography and so I kind of changed some settings made it into a, a you know like videography kind of camera was it the best no because it wasn't built for that but I, I I mean I I had to like utilize what I could afford um so I just recently updated my camera but like I'm, I'm slowly doing that and like my next big thing is to buy um a mic for my DSLR um because beforehand my first camera couldn't plug in an external mic into it. That's the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, I do have this <laughs> mic, but it's for like sitting down and recording situations. It's not for the camera. So, um, yeah. Sure. So, yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, and it's doing the same thing. It's just kind of like making things work. Like, um, how do you make your space less echoey? Um, I mean, I don't have the, I don't have like the foam blocks to like. <laughs> You know, make this room soundproof but i mean just like a simple sheet or something will do the trick you know so and i've been known to like on field shoots you know where it's you had just whether it was wind or traffic or just whatever just a bad audio situation i'll tell you what the the iphone voice memos app has saved me in a pinch on more than one occasion mm. just stick that thing in someone's pocket or something like that um or in a prop or something i think what well, it's it's surprise it's and i'm sure you can talk to people older than us too i'm sure that they're they can't even believe it but it always surprises me how good things are just at the most, you know, basic level. Like the, speaking yeah. of iPhones and smartphones and people are like, to think that, you know, Tangerine was filmed on iPhone fives and it, it went to sun. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. It went to Sundance. So it's, it's not like technology or, or equipment um, shouldn't get it. Shouldn't be your stopping block because if you're using it as it's like, Oh, I, I can't do this because I don't have that. It's not necessarily the case. Um, and and particularly, I mean, there's oh shoot, uh, Sarah, what's that app called? And I have it. I had to find it. There's that like app. It's ten dollars in the in the, in the um, Apple App Store. It's uh, Film Mic Pro, maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, something like that. Like that that gives you so much manual control over your iPhone camera settings. Yeah, and so like even I have on my phone, um, I have a Moment uh, phone case uses moment lenses and so there's like the phone case is probably thirty dollars and with their and their lenses can range you know hundred dollars or so but just so that and i can have different you know focal lengths on my phone so i guess once again like what sarah and i have been saying is that it's equipment shouldn't there's a it shouldn't get in your way there's a lot you can do with what you have or might cost you a little bit but not too much you know to get you there yeah absolutely i use some of the like some apps that you have um I have Filmic Pro, I have Previous Pro, which is kind of like a um, a set and like cinematography layout kind of app where you can set up your shots in like a 3D format and kind of take a look at uh, what you're making. Uh, I have a light meter that kind of like de detects like your um, f-stop aperture, things like that um, for your camera based on like what the room is. Um, so all these like little different apps, some are free, some are just a couple bucks. Um, all of them are really, you know, easy to use and very like, you know, for a low budget, things like that. And I love how you were kind of like mentioning, um, the different accessories that are also available to the iPhone, um, just to kind of like make your camera situation a little bit better. Um, I mean, I, I filmed off my phone for a project for my class, <laughs> of course, when like it was, you know, during COVID and I was like, I don't really want to deal with my DSLR issues that I'm having. So I'm just gonna do it off my phone. And like those accessories and those apps helped tremendously and it turned out pretty good, so. Oh, perfect. Um, and so then I guess the natural transition um, from talking about equipment and, and production itself as moving now into, into post-production and the editing world. Um, and once again, I don't think, I don't, well, I don't know. This I'm, I'm hoping this is not new news to anybody, but it could be. Just with with the once again when we're talking about 
free programs, free software. Um, if you have a MacBook, um, you, it com it comes with iMovie. Uh, excuse me, iMovie. If you have Windows, uh, it comes with Windows Movie Maker, which is the first editing software I ever learned and used for for years until I got a Mac when I was in college. Um, yeah. Dissolve, or sorry, DaVinci Resolve, free, and that thing is a beast. So there's so there's so many different options out there no matter your operating system and if you don't have if you don't have even if you don't have like a desktop computer let's say you have an iPad or you have an iPhone you can download iMovie for the iPad or for the iPhone like you know there's just so Literally. many tools yeah. out there <laughs> yeah there's there's sure it might be I think that's the thing when you're when you're talking about okay what can I get you know on the cheap or for free or for less money of course there's a trade off and the trade off sometimes is convenience. And, or maybe it doesn't have like the robust features that you were looking for, but hey, that's the trade-off. At least once again, when when you're talking about short films or, or you're talking about low budget filmmaking, it's usually when you're just trying to get projects under your belt so you can graduate to bigger and better things. So you just got to work with what you got. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was first starting out um, in late middle school, early high school, and I was like first making my like first little films, I used an iPad. And I'd like to call myself the iMovie master because I was doing things that I don't think iMovie knew I could do. <laughs> like there was obviously like a Ken's Burns effect on, you know, the app, but like I was, I was like doing some weird stuff. And if I couldn't, if, if there wasn't something I couldn't do in the app, I'd like take a screenshot it, like fix it and then I'd re-upload it to iMovie and then like try you know so I was I was I would I, I would um I, I did the illegal thing because iMovie offers um some sound effects not a whole lot I would like screen uh screen record YouTube and then I would get those sound effects that I wanted from YouTube by doing it slightly illegally but it's fine <laughs> so I was I was I became a master at iMovie wait that's smart though yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not smart in the sense that it's not, you're not supposed to do that, <laughs> but I never, never well, re-uploaded the videos anywhere. But I was like just... using, <laughs> see, I was like, to, like, uh, getting viruses on my computer by using like YouTube to mp3.com. I never thought about just screen recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I, I, cause I was, again, I was like limited in what I could afford and what I had. So I made the, literally, I made the best of uh, what I had. And I'm not recommending you record off YouTube because then it's illegal. So please don't do it. But I mean, I, I was in middle school. I didn't know any better. But <laughs> point being, point being, you can make the simplest of, of you know, softwares um, accessible and in, in, into your, you know, abilities and things like that. Um, you know, it may not be the best option, but there's a way, there's a way that you can do something. You just have to figure it out on it. Um, you mentioned, you know, Final Cut, Da Vinci, things like that. Great options. I've had experience in Final Cut, not so much Da Vinci, but I've had experience in Final Cut. Um, it's a great step above iMovie, offers a lot of, a, a lot more different um, options for a smaller, uh, a smaller price. And then of course, like the big boys are <laughs> Adobe Premiere and Avid Media Composer. Um, Media Composer makes me cry because it's so hard to use. Um, and of course, they're quite expensive. But again, if you're a student, if you work at you know a specific job, take a look at discounts and you know other offers that you can get to kind of make that um, expense a little bit cheaper. Our, our next uh, kind of section in the post-production uh, process is visual effects and score, uh, so your soundtrack. Um, well, I don't want to say the smart person, let's not use that word, but a lot of people choose not to have visual effects or the need for visual effects in their film if they're thinking wisely about their budget because visual effects can get pretty expensive to use and create. Um, so you're, you're better off trying not to um, involve that kind of need in your film. But of course, if it's very important and very essential to your film, there's still many different ways where you can kind of pull that off on a budget. 
you can try um, your hand at it yourself on <laughs> After Effects, um, Adobe After Effects, or you can find, you know, someone looking to gain experience. A lot of uh, students um, kind of like, you know, joining film sets and things like that at Cruz. A lot of visual effects students are looking to gain experience and would love to be a part of your project uh, for free. Um, now some, you know, there's, you know, there's others that you need to pay for and kind of put that expense out. So, um, depending on the quality of what you're looking for, um, you know, incorporate that into your budget. But a lot of times a student will do it for free and just as great. So that's uh, another option if you're kind of looking down that route for visual effects. As far as score, the same, same sort of thing. There's, there's a lot of different students that study, um, composition and things in college and are looking to gain experience um, in that sort of area and would love to add that to the resume. Again, it's another sort of thing that you, if you're looking for kind of like a step above, you would need to um, pull out an expense for, but uh, still, still good, still good um, option. Um, I'm actually curious, Jordan, because I actually don't know this question. Um, are you, do you, have you had like any experience needing visual effects or a score or music on a film and what's your experience with trying to get that if if you have uh visual effects absolutely not visual effects terrify me in the sense of uh just like after effects is very stressful to me and so i've never, I've never worked on a project personally where i've needed to have visual effects um I have people ask me a lot, hey, we're looking for someone who does like VF, do you like, do you do that? And I'm always like, no, but I guess I should learn, but it's not really my, my wheelhouse. Um, but with the, the audio side of things, or I should say sound or score side of things, um, I've been trying, Sarah, for like the past week to find the names of these websites um, that, I, that I've used in the past and I can't find figure them out at all. Um, but they, they exist in the interwebs. Um, where it's a similar to like a Spotify situation where it's a subscription service, like a nominal monthly fee, nine, ten dollars a month, and you have access to this entire library of copyright free music intended to be used for film scores, for video scores, things like things of nature, all sorts of different vibes. And you can and you usually can search the database by like the tone or, or atmosphere down to sometimes even instrument or and length and things like that so there's definitely a lot of more a lot of things that have popped up in the past couple of years um, particularly when it comes to that film score side of things that are so helpful to low budget filmmakers um and there's one that actually just came out came across my radar like a week ago and uh and i can't find it i'm actually getting very frustrated because i wanted to use it for something um but yeah, there's definitely, you don't have to necessarily like do the, the quote unquote custom route anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, let, and let's be honest back in the day, like speaking of iPads and, um, iMovie, there was a, a, a day and I, I we're never, ever going to resurrect this video of, of, this is probably like high school me when GarageBand for the iPad just came out. I was like, oh yes, I can score this myself because I have GarageBand, don't trash absolute trash <laughs> but you know those kind of things do exist if you if you are someone who has any type of you know like music uh inclinations yeah and back to your point about like websites and things like that um not only not only like soundtracks and score and music and things like that but um you can find a lot of sound effects on these sites as well um like door creek footsteps things like that are still mm -hmm. available on all these sites the one i so i don't know if it'll help you but the ones that i use are sound snap and story blocks i don't know if they were the ones that you were thinking of but those are the ones they were they were not that also offer that like monthly uh fee or um or or like um for 20 bucks you can get like 15 free down or free da uh, 15 downloads um so so something like that but i didn't know if those the ones you're thinking of Unfortunately, not. But they sound like they're in the same in the same pocket. Yep, yep. <laughs> and so, of course, after post is done, film is cut, finalized, everything is great and perfect. Well, now what do we do with it? Um, distribution. This is another situation where we are so fortunate to live in the area or the time of the internet. Um, there's almost I don't know, there's it's not countless, but there's so many free distribution platforms 
um, for you that you yourself, you don't have to work through any distributor to post to. And if you're listening to this podcast, I'm sure we're all going to say them in unison together. Um, YouTube, uh, TikTok, Twitter, yeah. Instagram, Facebook, like all, all of the digital platforms. Vimeo, of course, we, we always are going to give a little shout out to Vimeo um, because she sometimes feels like the posh, strange cousin. Um, so many great avenues to to get your film out there. The other cool thing that I like about these too is that each of these platforms have such like a specific aesthetic where you can really play. You know, you, you're not just, it's not like, oh, there's only YouTube. I can only upload like 10 minute videos. The only thing that works. So I have to make sure it's a 10 minute film. No, if you have a, I don't know, a 42 second short film that might work, work great on a platform like TikTok or Instagram, it, it's out there. So there's a lot of room for not just once again, just for you to go out there and put your put your work out there. Um, there's also a lot of room for experimentation as well, um, which is, I think, you know, when you're talking about low budget filmmaking and or making a film with, with little to no money, it's all about like experimenting and pushing the, the envelope and seeing like what you can do um, in a variety of ways. And then of course, when distribution comes with marketing and we've talked a lot about marketing um, in the pre-production sense, but the same rules apply to post. Um, a lot of ways to just, you know, to connect with people and to build an audience and to get your film out there and be seen. Yeah. And also, um, it's important if you're really passionate about your film and your quality of it and you think it's great, um, it's important to set aside part of your budget for uh, film festivals and submitting it to there. A lot of them have a small fee mm -hmm. for submitting your festival. So it's very important to kind of like Take a look at the ones that you want to submit to. Take a look at the prices and then incorporate those into your budget. Absolutely. So, Sarah, if you're if you're down for this, I know we've talked about a lot of things in a lot of different areas, and I'm going to try to do my best to kind of sum it up in a couple of key points. But oh, obviously, absolutely. please, please, um, like input on this as well. Um, I think the biggest from from my experience, the, the biggest thing when you're talking about low to no budget filmmaking, first, it's what is your budget? And it's not what do we want our budget to be? It's what's our budget? Is it is it $100? Is it $300? Is it $3,000? And work backwards from that, from, from every angle. It's, you know, we don't, it's, unfortunately, it's not like, oh, yeah. I have this vision and I, and I just have to just like go and fulfill it. A lot of times, no, it's like, I have this much money. So how much can I, can I do with this? And then work from a, from a pre uh, uh, production post and, and distribution standpoint from that. At least that's a, how it's been helpful. Once again, in my experience, because it also helps me, uh, it, it has helped me to kind of figure out okay, what's, what's most important, where, what's, what's fat that we can cut out. That's not, that's more of just something that I want. That's like very gratuitous. It doesn't really necessarily do anything for the story or for the plot or for the theme. Um, uh, so that, so I don't know if that's, that's too vague, but I, but it, it's, cause it seems when you say it, it sounds really, really simple and clear cut, but it really, it kind of is. It's just, you know, what's be realistic with yourself and with your budget and, and work from that. Um, with one notable yeah. exception, and this has rung true on every anything I've worked on, whether it's narrative work, whether it's commercial work, nonprofit work, never scrimp on food. Make sure <laughs> you, if you have zero, if you have twenty dollars, make sure that twenty dollars, and all you have is twenty dollars. Make sure that twenty dollars is spent on feeding your cast and your crew. Because we all know what happens. We all know it's just not a very good. The only way that a film can be, can, uh, the only way that set can work is if everybody, you know, is feeling good, which doesn't always happen. But one of the best ways to make people feel good is are they fed? Are they uh, hydrated? So are they yeah. confident as well? Yeah. You don't, you don't, the last thing you want is a bunch of hangry people on your set. Um, yeah. And from a first experience too, just like a 30 minute break does wonders for you. So <laughs> yeah, a long, long time. I, it's interesting because you're talking, you're uh, jumping back to the point of like, what's the budget? This is not planned. It's not in my notes. I just came up with it on a whim. So I apologize if it sounds very sloppy, but it's like the three W's is 
what's your uh, what's Ooh. your budget? Who are you with? Uh, being kind of like who, who who's your cast? Who's your crew? Um, how are you utilizing those people? Um, and then my third W would be where is this going? <laughs> so um, where is this going? As in like, are, am I going to need visual effects by the end of this? How much do I need to put out towards score things like that? And what kind of film festivals should I be looking out for in the upcoming months? Because it's also very important to make sure you meet those deadlines. Um, a lot of people they can just think they can submit to a festival on a whim, but it doesn't really work that like work like that because uh, there's there's a there's a time frame you need to submit it, <laughs> and unfortunately, if you don't submit it in time and then you wait till the next year, it actually might be too late to submit your film because your film has to be made within a certain year um, for it to be eligible for a film festival. Um, like for the one, uh, for instance, like the one I'm a part of, um, you can't, um, it can't, no, it, the film can't be no more than a year old um, in order to submit it. It has to be within a year made. So um, with COVID, um, those regulations kind of uh, you know, we're a little bit of adjusted, uh, kind of to extend a, a small amount of time for people to c keep creating and things like that. But, uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry if that sounded really sloppy, but Sarah, no, I think that was actually really awesome. Do you think you could resurrect those, those three W's real quick then? Yeah. Well, I will give credit to the first one to you because you did say that. So the first one is what's your budget? Who are you with? Where is this going? I fucking love that, sir. I'm about to tap that to my body. Um, no, I think that, I think that's that's it. That's like that's this hour plus episode in real in, in three concise, succinct points. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm applauding. I didn't want to like you know get too hot on the mic here. Um, no, yeah, that, that, and that's it. And I think that it's 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 one of those things where it's like it's it's hard to sometimes. I don't know. I always try to like listen, like pretend that I'm listening to myself giving this advice, and it's like, well, duh. Like, you don't have a lot of money, then don't spend a lot of money, or da da da. And but it's it's one of those things where uh, I don't know. It's it, it can be difficult to contextualize and to and to make it into like actionable advice. And I think that these these three W's kind of once again just give a good framework to where you can begin if you're trying to make a film and you and you know you're not gonna, or you know you're going to have a very limited budget i think those those three areas are your keys yeah <laughs> absolutely well that's there i think i honestly think it's not going to get better than that because i think that's it yeah I think that's like the creme de la creme <laughs> I, i'm yeah i'm pretty much i am I'm, I'm all out of advice and facts i think that that's uh, as bad as much as i can give right now uh this late at night so oh man well well it works like it like you, like you pull it on bag every time um <laughs> so yeah so it, it, with that um thank you again for checking out this week's episode um of course the third episode of martini shot and to take a look at what we're working on, casting calls, newsletters, and more, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Nantico. That's N-A-N-T-I-C-O. And visit our website uh, at nanti.co. That's N-A-N-T-I dot C-O. Uh, we also have YouTube and TikTok channels that we've been posting all of our pod podcast episodes up on, as well as uh, our short films. So you can uh, visit us there at Nantico as well. And we will see you next week.